it's uh, Luke chapter 1 is where we are. It's stories of Christmas, and this one today is on Mary, and it's really hard to grasp who Mary really was because of the depth of, for instance, her prayer, her character. It's really hard to imagine that it was likely a 15 Honestly, we say 16, 17-year-old, you're getting a little, a little high. It's probably more likely 15-year-old young lady. I've had a 15-year-old in the past read this text for us, and it's been fun to just see an actual young person read the words that are coming out of her mouth that were Mary's prayer because it almost doesn't match. It's an Oswald Chambers type thing. You read this prayer of hers and you're like, surely you're a 55-year-old who's walked with the Lord for 40 years. No. It was a 15-year-old who had a depth about her and specifically a humility about her, and that's what we're going to speak to is the humility of Mary. If you have your Bible there in Luke chapter 1, I want to give the little backstory and little context of what was going on when she prayed that spectacular prayer, the Magnificat, which is what we're going to talk about today. Luke chapter 1, up there in verse uh, verse 5, it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah and had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. They were both right righteous before the Lord and walking blamelessly in the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child. Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years." Now, pause a minute and think about context of where we are. If you think of a map, Bethlehem is literally seven miles, eight miles south of Jerusalem. It's like, it's like right there. Lots of, I have friends that live in Bethlehem that work in Jerusalem. It's just a small commute. It's kind of a Cannonsburg thing for us. It's, yeah, it's same town. We're just, we're just right here close. That's where Bethlehem is. And then that's south of Jerusalem, and just east of Jerusalem is a little community, and that's where Elizabeth lived. But then north, about 70 miles, is Nazareth. That's where Mary is. Mary's in Nazareth. So go back down just a little east of Jerusalem. It says there was serving a priest before God when a division uh, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. How many times have we read this story? Because this is what happens. He goes in, he's chosen by lot, he goes in to burn incense, and you are literally as close to the presence of God as you'll ever get, except for that one priest once a year who goes into the most holy. This is literally right there in the holy place. You could see the entrance to the Holy of Holies. And Zechariah is chosen to go burn incense by lot. It's by lot, standard Old Testament thing. It is to eliminate uh, our will. It eliminates preference, preferential treatment. It eliminates, it just let's choose by lot who goes. And what many people don't know is that Zechariah being chosen for this duty is the highlight of his career. Priests will go their entire career and not get to go in to burn the incense in the holy place. This is a big deal. So this is his big moment. And when he went in, the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of the incense. That's verse 10. And then 11, and there appeared to him 
an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and he fell down, uh, fell upon him, fear fell upon him, and the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be a great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God, and he will go before him in the spirit of power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers, the children, the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. But Zechariah said, how shall I know this? We're, we're already going to separate the difference between when Mary's told that she's with child and Zechariah is told that they're with child. There's already a difference. We have a priest who responds with uncertainty. In contrast to the 15-year-old, she did not. So this was a slight problem. Zechariah said to the angel, How should I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said, Well, I'm Gabriel. I love that. Only two angels are mentioned in the Bible, Michael and Gabriel. Michael's the warrior. He's a fighter. And there's Gabriel. And I love that. Well, it's because I'm Gabriel. That's, that's how we know this is happening. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will now be silent and unable to speak until that day that these things take place, because you didn't believe my words, which will be filled in their time. People were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered what the delay was in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. They realized that he'd seen a vision, and he kept making signs to them. And he remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, but for five months then she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when I looked on him uh, to take away the reproach among people. Okay, here it goes now, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end." We're literally at the scene in Jerusalem. Now Gabriel shows up in Nazareth of all places to a 15-year-old who somehow is able to swallow this news. Gabriel's known for, if you looked at the traits of Gabriel, just look online just for the fun of it, like what are the traits? One of them is he's scary. He's not even the fighter. Because he regularly has to say when he shows up, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't be, I, I get it all the time. I get it all the time. Relax. He did it with Zechariah. He's doing it again with Mary. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? The, ans the angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived. And this is the sixth month with her 
who was called barren, for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed. It's a relative. Elizabeth's a relative. Your Bible may say cousin. A little liberty there. The age wouldn't have fit anyway. The word is a common word. It means kinsman. It's, he's, she's, they're kin. They're kinfolk. They're of same blood. The likelihood is that Mary's mom, Anna, Elizabeth's sister, it's Aunt Elizabeth. Right after she hears it, in those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town of Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, and it's the famous Magnificat, based on the Latin of the first phrase, my soul magnifies. Let's soak this in for just a minute. There's some personality trait happening here, too. There's a couple prayers that you would look at. If you were studying this, you would read Mary's prayer, and you would, Bible scholars that you are, and a little help with some footnotes, you would discover it's very similar to Hannah's prayer. Well, Hannah's in Samuel when she delivers her little baby boy, finally gets this baby boy and says, thank you, and I'm going to leave him at the temple, and she has her prayer. It's longer. Different spirit. They're not the same. But part of it reveals their personality. You really get the personality of Elizabeth here because Elizabeth is just out of control. She's just so excited. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your... She's not even thinking about herself anymore. The baby, she felt the movement, and immediately she is just... She is happy Aunt Elizabeth for Mary. And what do I do deserve you, Mary, being here in my presence? I just can't even believe. She was more excited. There's a, a little tumultuous where she's excited about what's going on. Mary's different. Mary's different. Mary is this 15-year-old girl where the waters are running really deep. And she's steady. There is this humility about her. There is this spirit of, I don't deserve this, that almost overwhelms the excitement of what's happening. Because Mary said, and it's the last part that we read, here it is. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's looked at the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He's scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from the thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. 
And Father, we're turning our hearts to you right now in prayer, and we're asking if you would encourage us today. Timeless words that you inspired through Mary. Pray that we would be able to adopt some of this, these great traits of Mary into our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd encourage you, again, I don't know if you guys like this kind of I just printed the prayer, and I just colored pencils. You know that big pen that has the four colors? Are those not a sweet ride? They are so nice. I have them everywhere. Is that true? Aren't they about it? Oh, she's like, yeah. They're in each car, has their allotted one. They come in different uh, barrel colors, light blue, silver, silver. I don't let anyone use. So you could write on it, and you discover some pretty unique things about this. Verse 49, for he is mighty. He's done great things for me. Holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him. Mighty, holy, and mercy. It's power, holiness, and mercy. Like, how is she, how does she know I mean, could you imagine if we all got around a table and for fun and we all got our own, uh, I'll loan you a Bic four-color pen and we all sit there in a circle and we'll talk about something great in your life and say, now write a prayer. I'm, no offense. Mine would be, here, Lord, thanks for a great day. I mean, I, thanks for this food. Who knows what I would say in this prayer of of a 57-year-old trying to craft, how do you respond to God? We have a 15-year-old girl who covers a spectacular array of things, and we mentioned the three, the power, holiness, and mercy, and then, oh, I don't know, there's 18 times she says, he has. Now, eight times he says, he has done this, he has done this, he has done this. Well, there's an emphasis. There are six, look at verse, uh, whatever verse that is, maybe 51. He has shown strength. He has scattered the proud. He's brought down the mighty and exalted those humble estate. He's filled the hungry and the rich he has sent away empty. Six times she's speaking of very specific acts of God. And I, I, wonder, I just wonder, we're caught up with so much that's going on in our lives, and we're so caught up in a bank account in our house, and we're so caught up in what's going to happen next and how our kids are going to work out and what's going on with our parents, and we're, we're worried about all of this stuff that's so fluid. Mary has clearly invested an enormous amount of time in the concrete truths of God as they've been revealed in the Old Testament for her. That she just, she just spoke it. And you say, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's it's written a long time ago, and I'm sure it's been added to. I, I, don't, I don't know. There's some pretty early copies of this. And there wasn't a reason to take out of everything found in the book of Luke, like we're going to spend extra time and craft this. No, it's a lot of effort was, how did she say it? And let's reveal what she said. And the depth of creativity, could you imagine what it could do in our lives, in the chaos of our lives, if we devoted an enormous amount of time of studying the Scriptures to know God and His traits? in contrast to reading his word, scraping for truths that I need to help me in my chaos. See, there's a big difference. All of our lives have a fair amount of chaos to it. And when we open the scriptures and the truths of God's word, we are to abandon the chaos to sit quietly and calmly reading his word. Instead, 
we stay in our chaos and we grab the Bible text that we're reading and bring it into our chaos to try to make order out of things. And what we've just done was we've turned what we're reading into the equal amount of chaos of which we're living. Mary was so consumed and so overwhelmed by who God is. That's why she didn't even question it. And you got to love the faith of a young person. That's what we have in contrast. That'd be another study for us. We got a lot of side studies going on. Take the Zachariah story and the Mary story, and the depth of knowledge and experience, and he was a righteous man. It said so. Him and Elizabeth were special people. And yet one of them doubted (laughs) which one would it be. And that wasn't even hardly anything to, she was barren, it was beyond years. Not like in Abraham and Sarah. Don't think that kind of barren and beyond years. They weren't like that. But it was just that she's pregnant and she, he's going to be Elijah-like. And Mary's over here going, yeah, I wish mine was maybe that simple. I'm not even with a guy. And it's not just a prophet like Elijah. It's kind of the son of God. I mean, it was over the top. And yet she's like, got it. Got it. What do we do next? And I think a lot of it is based on this humility she had. And I want to cover three quick points on the humility of Mary. The first one is that Mary's humility flowed spontaneously. Mary's humility flowed spontaneously. A lot of us, if not most of us, when we're hit with something, we stumble a bit and then get our footing. You know, horrible phone call. We stumble. Our faith, we're not really sure, don't know what side's up, and then finally, we're set. Mary had it spontaneously. Mary had this depth about her, and specifically in her humility, that created that when she got bumped, humility and trust came out. So I take with me, when I travel, I always take a a cup and saucer. Not like a flowery like one. It's feminine enough that it's a cup and saucer. It doesn't need flowers. I get them from all over. I think my favorite is from from Rome, and it was um, at the burial place of St. Paul. In, uh, in Rome, and it's a nice cup and saucer. The problem with it is, and I, like on airplanes then, I'll, I'll have it, and I just did a flight this spring. We, was coming, we were coming back from Istanbul, and I went back middle of the night with my cup and saucer, and the guy back, there, he, he looks, he goes, really? I'm like, well, yeah, you guys used to do this. And he goes, yeah, back before our time. So he actually heated the cup like you do at a uh, coffee shop, He goes, if you're going to have a cup and saucer, I'm at least going to heat it for you. So he steamed it and got it all hot for me. Well, when you're carrying a cup and and saucer, uh, it's pretty easy to spill it. It, There's not much in there. It's a little flimsy. Uh, My hands aren't real sturdy. or uh, They tend to shake a bit, so you can even hear me coming because of the clanging. And if you bump me, if you bump me when I'm carrying that, uh, I'm going to be drinking out of the saucer a little bit, right? Like the old guys used to do in the diner. I'm told they used to do that. They pour it into the saucer because it's too hot, and they drink the saucer first, and then they drink it. You bump me, whatever's in it at the time, and it could be a black tea or it could be a coffee, whatever's in it comes out. And for us, when we get bumped, Whatever is in us comes out. It's too late. 
It's too late in crisis to try to build some depth and become a pillar. No, crisis doesn't help you become. It reveals who you are. Mary was already a deep believing person with faith and humility. That's why she was chosen for the task. And when she got bumped with some news that was just beyond spectacular, what flowed out? This unbelievable prayer. Look at her reaction. She traveled 70 miles, 80 miles. Once she got news of Elizabeth, off she went. You look at her responses and you realize, not predetermined, but they're pre-prepared. Her humility flowed spontaneously. Her humility flowed, second point is, indiscriminately. Indiscriminately. Another way to look at this prayer is to see these categories The first three verses are prayer, it's mercy for herself. One, two, three. The next four are mercy for others. And the last two are mercy for Israel. How does she do this? It's about her. It's her story. I really don't like that the Catholic Church has so just shy of deified her. You've ruined her. You bring that up for a vote, Mary's going to be the first one to say, no way. Like, how did you completely misunderstand me? I am an unworthy servant. That's what I am. And we've lifted her. There are movements, I don't know if you know this, there are theological movements where they're trying to deify her. In the Vatican, the, the theologians in the Vatican are pretty spectacular. They know there's not a chance you can do that. You deify Mary, you've just lost the humanity of Jesus. You lose the humanity of Jesus, you just lost the death, burial, resurrection, substitutionary death. A theologian knows that immediately. You can't do that. So let's push her up as far as we can and ruin her. The beauty of you in your walk with Christ is that you go to work faithfully and that you are working with your family and you spend time with family and you coach a team and you're volunteering here. The beauty of what you do is how you live for the Lord the way you live for the Lord in humility. No need to ruin it by saying, oh, but look at the great things they did. No, let's look at the boring, mundane things that you've done (laughs) out of a love and faithfulness to the Lord. That's Mary. And if there is a time in which Humanly speaking, you want to be tapped to do something, quote, great, you're available. Mary would have been just fine marrying Joseph as planned, have a slew of kids, live just a wonderful, she would have been the greatest neighbor in the world. Her, the fresh bagels that she'd bring over every morning would just be terrific baklava, I don't know what else, what other Jewish treat. She'd been a great neighbor. That's Mary. And who did she wish mercy to? She wished mercy for herself. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He's looked at the humble or the low estate of his servant, handmaiden. She's referring to herself. He who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And then she turns it and wishes a blessing for generations and for others. She wishes protection and mercy and care for Israel. In 
indiscriminately. There is a subject within the church, in probably our type of church, and I say our type, uh, Baptistic, where we're not so indiscriminate. We, we judge, and it's like we feel like we can bring God's judgment on certain groups. I mean, because I read the Facebook posts. I get the emails. I get the forwards. Forward this to 50 people. And it's wishing bad on a president or saying things that are just disrespectful to a president or to a congressperson or a, or a type of person because they're ruining America. Now, I think what's ruining America is there aren't enough Marys. Mercy to everybody. We should pray God's mercy and grace to everybody. F.B. Meyer is a great old writer. And he once said that when we see a person, two things come to our mind when we see a person's sin. So, somebody's sin. Two things come to our mind. First, F.B. Meyer says, first, we don't know how hard he or she tried to not sin. And second, we don't know the power of the forces that assailed against them. We also don't know what we have d would have done in the same circumstance. That's humility. So I see things that I think are blatantly wrong and destructive to society, destructive to family. I don't know, my first, what's my first response? I think my first response is, oh, I can't believe them. How do they not know? It's supposed to be obvious. It is to the rest of the world. And it's just the slew of remarks rather than one of humility that says, okay, first of all, I don't know how they were raised. I don't know what came upon them. I don't know the forces that surrounded them that has produced this. And I don't know if I wouldn't be exactly the same if I were in all of that. Am I right? But we're not hearing that reminder enough. That's all. We're not hearing the reminder. I'm not excusing the behavior. Well, that's not it. That's just not my, it's not my place. My place is to show love and compassion and kindness. People should be flocking to our church because it's full of love. But they don't flock to a church because we're going to immediately size them up and we immediately judge. So that was F.B. Meyer. 1929 is when he said that. It was kind of deep. Or, here's another more fun one, and this would be from a Cheyenne Native American proverb, and you know what it is, especially with issues of racism or inclusiveness or whatever. Don't judge your neighbor until you walk two moons in his moccasins. So we have F.B. Meyer on one side who says it theologically and he's like a, he's a powerhouse. Then you have the Native American way that says, no, how do you judge them unless you walk for a while with them? I'm not saying I'm going to probably change my view of what's right and wrong because I see that clearly in the Scriptures. I know what's right and wrong because it's revealed to us. But when we walk the two moons in their moccasins, we go, oh, okay, now my heart goes out for them, and I want to love them into a place of freedom from whatever sin that is. It's very different. It's the last, uh, maybe the last uh, point here, about her humility. It brought her complete rest. I think this is what I'm noticing more for myself. 
when we're in a complete, a complete humility before the Lord, our hands are open and we just, we're like, my life's yours, my bank account, or in some cases, my bills, right? Or my car, my house, my family. It's all yours, Lord. And there's a spirit of humility before the Lord. What comes with it is a spirit of rest. We want to handle it ourselves. That's the pride. I can take care of this. I can do this. I can straighten them out. Let me at them. Let me make the phone call. No. It's a complete humility before the Lord. There's a, uh, there's a famous uh, Pennsylvanian who is a favorite uh, painter of Sarah's and mine, Edward Hicks. Edward Hicks was a Quaker uh, painter, and what he did was he painted stagecoaches, and he painted signs, and so a lot of his work has lettering or words on it. They're in museums all over the place. The one that's like in a lot of kids' rooms, actually several of his are in a lot of kids' rooms, there's one called the Peaceable Kingdom. And if you, if you Google Peaceable Kingdom, you'll see, you'll see these very recognizable uh, animal faces. <clears throat> I've seen them in lots of things. Um, and there's lettering all around the painting. But there's one that is the killer uh, one for in a uh, house, and see, or for in a kid's room, and it's this one. Have you guys seen that one before? You know, you'll even bump into it like in, um, at a uh, TJ Maxx, kind of with all those pictures. It's just a poster of it framed. It's a very, very familiar and recognizable. It is, of course, called Noah's Ark. There are many variations of it from different angles. It's almost like he took different pictures. He was so consumed by it that he would just redo it. Edward Hicks was known for his humility. There's a phrase that I, I'll, I'll glance at it, but I probably don't need to. This is what he said of himself. He said, I am nothing but a poor, old, worthless, insignificant painter. So he was known for, he died four miles from where he lived. It was north of Philadelphia, really more outside of Trenton. And everyone knew this guy's the most humble guy you'll ever meet, but there's some depth. Like that painting. There's some odd things about this painting. Maybe you sit long enough and you kind of have to. I don't know the reason why there actually are two humans in the painting, and it's just an odd addition. It's on the left side. They're black silhouettes. I don't know why they're there. I don't know what the significance of them being darkened. But there's a couple other odd things about this particular painting. One is that Noah's Ark is docked. That's a little odd. And I remember sitting in front of this. We have one. We have one that's a poster, but you can get it done where it's uh, kind of like a, um, a clear coat over top of it. It looks like paint marks, and it looks like a painting. And that's what our, our copy looks like. And we were literally just sitting with some friends. And we were just actually just looking at it. And we were talking about that. I mentioned the docked. And that's when we noticed that in the back left, and I'm not even sure above the animals, above where the characters are, it's actually a little town. And if you look at it in high resolution on your phone or something, you'll see there's actually a church and a steeple. It's a modern town. And we sat and we're just kind of looking at it and thinking, this is a little bit of an indictment. It's a little indictment on modern society. Edward Hicks had this deep running water within him as a Quaker. 
a faith in the Lord that was pretty phenomenal, but pretty unrecognized. He has worked every day. Imagine him painting a stagecoach. His paintings are in museums all over the world. Imagine having a stagecoach or your dental sign. He painted it for you. You and I are called to do what we're called to do, even if it is mundane. Go to work tomorrow, faithful with your family, faithful with your finances. Humbly walk before the Lord. I don't know if Edward Hicks was a little too much where he said, I'm nothing but a poor, old, worthless, insignificant painter. Almost want to hug him and say, no, 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 not that far. (laughs) Not that far. You're very significant. But I like the humility. We look at the story of Mary and we look at the story of that prayer of hers. In so many ways, she's not able to be matched in any of our lives, but in many ways she can be matched. Let's walk humbly before the Lord and do what you're called to do. Head down faithfully. No one's cheering for you when you're doing the laundry. No one's cheering for you when you're doing tasks at work or you're at school and you were kind. No one cared. Nobody. But you were just faithfully walking with the Lord, living out humbly, wishing mercy and peace in God's kindness upon people indiscriminately. Isn't that beautiful? That's Christmas. It's the manger scene. There he is. For who? For anyone who believes. Well, he came for them. No, he came for everyone who believes. The humility and the kindness of Jesus Christ to die for me and you because we need it. Separated from God because of our sin, he died for us. All who believe in him have everlasting life. Let's pray together. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the beautiful story of Mary. Thank you for her remarkable character traits, especially of humility. Help us to live in a humility before you and a humility before others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.